quick announcement for today. Uh, a reminder that homework zero is uh, due today. It's on Canvas. Uh, many of you have already done are already done with your homework zero. And in case you haven't started, well, you still have another few hours. It shouldn't take a few hours, but you know you still have that. Um, some people got into Canvas late, and uh, uh, I'm giving you one week uh, by manually adding the time. If you got onto Canvas late because you got a permission code or something like that, uh, send a message to me and the TAs, and one of us will make sure that you get your one week. And uh, speaking of getting onto Canvas late, the class is still oversubscribed. Um, I think about eight or 10 of you must have received permission codes uh, this morning. I think I expect there'll be no more than one or two more uh, positions that open. And after that, I'm done. Um, and uh, the other announcement is about homework one, um, which will be available hopefully by tonight. Uh, this will be about, uh, I say most likely tomorrow morning because I just want to give myself a little bit of wiggle room. Um, if uh, everything works according to plan, it should be there tonight. Uh, any questions about any of this? About the homework, about permission codes and uh, registration? Homework one will be about uh, decision trees and you'll be implementing stuff um, we'll, we'll be talking about decision trees today. Um, there's also the student survey on Canvas. I highly encourage you to spend some time on it. Uh, those of you who already have gone through it, uh, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, because it's interesting. Um, one immediate data point that I get is that almost all of you like Python, well, of the people who responded. Um, yeah, and then there are, you know, the, the other languages have some decreasing amount of uh, uh, preferences. But what is also interesting is that because most of you seem to like Python, we will target our uh, homeworks around Python. Uh, if you feel like you absolutely cannot use the language for whatever reason, uh, let us know. And if, if your preferred language is maybe one of these others, including this, we may be able to offer you help. Even R, yeah. Um, we may be able to offer you help. Um, I see one of my TAs is looking at me with dread. Um, <laughs> uh, but I would strongly recommend uh, using Python. Yeah. How do you take the square? How do you take How do you take the square? So, if you go to Canvas, uh, of course, uh, bear in mind the view that I have is different from what you see. Here's how I get there. There's a call, there's a on the left hand side. There's a column called quizzes. If you click that, you will find something. Okay. Uh, uh, one of the other things I learned from the quiz is that uh, you are an interesting lot. Um, there's a question there that asks, "What do you do outside class?" I'll I encourage you to. So, so if you answer something there, see if you can find yourself in that list. If not, uh, you know, the, the, this is you. So see if you can uh, uh, find the person who, for example, writes software for NASA. Um, it's an interesting group. There's always an interesting group of people in this class, and uh, this year is no exception. All right, any other questions? I mean, I don't think there's a question about this. Uh, I mean, if you have any questions about this, uh, figure it out on your own. Any concerns or issues that you want to get out of the way before we jump into the technical material for the class? If not, I'm going to pick up where we left off in the last lecture, just kind of remind you about where we were so that we can kind of, uh, um, uh, I, I felt like the last bit of this lecture was somewhat on the heavier side and it came at the end. So some of you were already checked out. So I want to revisit a little bit of that. So 
one of the big lessons from the last lecture is the idea that learning is search over functions. Why? Because we have some instances in the instance space. These are things that you apply your learned model to, like whatever your classifier or something. And then we have uh, labels uh, that your uh, learned system is supposed to predict. Now, if you think about what your uh, original, the Oracle system that your learned system is supposed to mimic, what it's supposed to do, it takes an instance and maps it into the label space. Mathematically, that's a function. So we have a target function. Sometimes the target function is called the Oracle. Sometimes it's called the, um, sometimes it's called a concept. You want to learn a concept. Sometimes it's, I'll call it nature. So there is this target function. And our goal is to find the function or a best approximation of that function. In, uh, in other words, that means that in order to find that function, we need to essentially search over all possible functions. So learning is search over functions. So this was one of the key points from the last lecture. But right after that, I introduced uh, this example here that said, suppose you are given this table of examples uh, where only the highlighted rows are visible. And I ask you to find the true functions, the hidden functions. Well, it turns out that this is really not a well-defined task. It is a well-defined task, but it's kind of problematic. Because I could fill up these question marks if I imagine that I, I am Oracle in this case, I am the decider of the concept function. And every time you make a guess, what I'll do is I'll apply that function that you guess to some row that still has a question mark. Let's say I apply it to this row and your guess, let's say predicts a plus or a, what do you call a, a one here. Because I'm adversarial and I get to decide the concept, what I'll say is, oh, you know what? The function that you guessed predicts a one for that row. Actually, it's a zero. So, which means I will reveal one more row in this thing. Now, it shouldn't be too hard for you to uh, kind of come to the conclusion that if I'm being truly adversarial here, the only way in which you can know the function is if you force me to reveal every row in this table. Right, so I need to give you essentially the entire. Or oh, there are sixteen rows here, and every row needs to be revealed for you to actually get the function. Because every time you make a guess, I'll tell you, oh, you're wrong. Because I can essentially adjust the target function on the fly and still be consistent with all of these existing uh, data points. Before we move on to this counting argument that I'll uh, repeat today. Any questions about this notion that an adversary can make learning impossible? Well, can make uh, learning useless because uh, then every possible instance needs to be observed. Questions? In what I can only interpret is stunned silence, I'm going to continue. Ah, there's a question. What if the adversary doesn't change the algorithm. It happens to not change the algorithm. Ah, let's assume that the adversary here is constrained. It's not a. Uh, it's yeah. If that's the case, then there is no fixed function, right? So I'm working with the adversary here, who has a set of functions that they are entertaining at any point, which are consistent with what has been agreed upon. Yeah, if you have an adversary that is allowed to change anything, then we basically have a random number generator. Yes. Why can the adversary change anything? Like that's what I'm not understanding. Why can if we're, if we're trying to discover a function for this data that we don't have, uh -huh. what what is the adversary? Where are we getting this data? How can we can decide what the one? Because the adversary is uh, essentially this idea that uh, we do not. It is entire. Uh, the adversary is just this sort of a. Uh, uh, conceptual device I'm using to point out that in the worst case, if your guesses are all wrong, you might end up having to see the entire table. You don't have to have an adversary. You could just be very, very unlucky. Okay, so that's the first point. So it, 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 learning without any assumptions 
could be problematic because you may have to see every possible data point. Now, to kind of think, uh, you know, make you think about what that means, if your uh, learned classifier, learned system is making decisions about images, let's say, to predict whether uh, an image contains a cat or not, does not contain a cat. And let's say we work with small images, say 256 by 256 uh, uh, pixels. The only way learning would be possible in that case is if every possible color attached to every possible pixel in that grid is known to you. At that point, what does it mean to learn? Because you've seen everything. You can just memorize the whole data, uh, everything. So that's uh, that's what that's one point. The second point is uh, to think about how many functions would there be. The only way this would work in this sort of a worst case slash adversarial scenario is if you are able to enumerate every possible function that exists uh, that is consistent with the data points that we have. If I want to think about every possible function that exists. I can put a zero here or a one here. I could put a zero here or a one here, 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 and so on. So there are seven outputs that are known. There are 16 rows in total. So nine, 16 minus seven is nine. So there are nine question marks. And each of those question marks can be uh, filled in with a zero or a one. And all of those are different functions, right? If I put a zero here, and anything else anywhere, there is one set of functions that gives a zero to that row. And there's a very different set of functions that gives a one there. So there are nine possible rows where I can put zeros and ones and they are all independent. So there are two power nine functions. This is, uh, it seems like two power nine is a small number, it's just 512. Sure, there are 512 things. I can write a for loop over 512 things. Okay, that's because there are four features here. What if you have a million features and you see a few thousand examples. So a few thousand is a negligible number compared to two power millions. So there are, if there are a million features, uh, did I make a mistake here? Yes, it, there, it's not two power nine, it's two power, two power nine. Because, no, no, sorry, I, I take it back. It is two power nine, yes. Uh, if there are a million features, then you have two power, two power million functions. That's an insanely big number. Please don't write for loops for those things. So, you know, something needs to be uh, done. So this is the uh, kind of the question that I, that was one of the last things we saw in the last lecture. How could learning be possible at all? If we have to search over every possible function. And the answer is rather simple. When you have a difficult problem that is computationally problematic, the first thing to try is make an assumption or make an approximation. One assumption is uh, the one that's really essentially explicitly or implicitly prevalent across machine learning is the idea that maybe not all possible functions that map the instances to the labels are even worth considering. Maybe I don't need to consider every possible function. I just need to consider a subset of them. Which subset is a different question? We'll come back to that. We'll, I, I just Maybe I just need to consider a subset of the functions that are interesting for reasons that uh, may be computational. I'll consider a small subset because I know how to search that subset. Maybe because you know something about the problem. I'll consider a small subset of functions that are the only functions that are possible because I'm an expert in this domain and only these eight things are possible and I just need my learning algorithm to figure out which of those eight. Or, you know, you could just be uh, deciding that I want to consider a subset of functions because uh, I have a program that can do the search. One way or another, you need to consider a small enough subset of functions that is reasonably good. So the last thing that I did in the lecture was consider to consider one such subset of functions called simple conjunction. A simple conjunction is the following class. You just take some subset of these variables, let's say x2 and x4, and I, the, the function is if x2 and x4 are both true, the label is one, otherwise the label is zero. 
Um, I understand that not everyone here has a computer science background. So this is just the symbol for and. So there, importantly, there are no negations here. The variables are not negated or something. The nice thing about simple conjunctions with four variables is that uh, it, 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 there's a, they have a fantastic property, which you may not appreciate yet, but uh, let me tell you, they are it's awesome because I can fit all of them on one slide. It's a fantastic property. It's a completely useless property for any other thing, but I can fit 16 things on one slide. So I can enumerate all of them. Um, and now I can check for each of these functions on these seven rows, does, do the, does this function produce the same output? If it does, then we have a, we have a winner. Sadly, this choice, even though it's convenient, it's not a great choice because uh, for every single row, I can find a counterexample. For the row X4, I have a counterexample in that is uh, this one here. The function that is just saying that when X4 is true, the output is true, should have predicted one because X4 has the value one. Well, the data says on that particular row, the label is zero. So X4 couldn't possibly be the function. And so on. Essentially, I have a list of counterexamples here. So this is not going to work. The problem that we had was we, the first problem that we had was the original set of functions was too large. It was two power uh, sixteen. It had two power sixteen elements. So we decided to make a uh, an, an assumption that maybe only one of these sixteen functions should be uh, is the right answer. Turns out that. Uh, the hypothesis space that we chose, the set of functions that are learner here, the learner here is basically just this enumeration. The hypothesis space that our learner chose is too small. And it's not possible that the true function could be in that hypothesis space. Questions? Yes. Do you have to guarantee that the true function is in the hypothesis space? I sense you're going somewhere with that. So why don't you finish the Rest of that. Why do you ask that question? Like, does the true function have to be completely true? Like, like you're having something, something. I like that thought. So, for now, let's pretend that's the case. So, the question was uh, oh, I'm going to try to re repeat the question so that people on Zoom can hear it. So, the question was do we need to guarantee that the true function is perfect? Uh, right? I mean, essentially, does it need to get the right answer for every one of these rows? For now, let's pretend that we need that. In practice, it's uh, it's too much to expect. We should be able to live with some error. It's possible that maybe out of all these rows, we got 90% of them for whatever, uh, or some high percentage. But we will, for at least a couple of weeks now, and then a few weeks later on, we'll pretend that the true function is in the search space. Yes. So it seems like you said something that is like, is it even correct to expect that because the impact of the searching and it's not learning and then it's not it's not too much. I would say I'm asking whether it's right to think that it's we should expect. Uh, what are we expecting? Can you? Uh, it to be fully correct. Is it even right to expect that it should be fully correct because that right. impact so the the question was, uh, is it even reasonable to expect? So uh, I said now that uh, for now, let's pre expect that the true function is in the set. And the question from, I'm, I should probably start asking people's names. What was your name? Adam, Adam and Sugi. Sugi. So in response to Adam's question, I said, let's pretend for now that the true function is in the uh, hypothesis space. And so Sugi's point is, that doesn't seem fair. That doesn't seem right. Should we even expect that the true function, that, that seems like asking for too much? Um, and the answer is, yeah, it is. Uh, for now, this is going to be a toy setting. There will be at least one learning algorithm that we will encounter that will actually try to do that, try to find the true function in the hypothesis space. Um, you use the word generalization. We haven't yet covered that, but essentially you're right. Uh, expecting the true function, we might end up no, I'm not going to say that because I'm not going to use the word that starts with O and ends with fitting. Um, yes. Uh, 
Yes. Yes. That, yeah, that's exactly it. If we pretend that if if let's say so, that's exactly what uh, uh, that's a that's a good way to say. It. The question was, uh, should does this mean that we expect our data has some underlying structure? In it? And implicitly, that's the assumption that we are making. We are assuming that not the data but the labeling function has some underlying structure in it. And because of that, we can kind of find it easily by only searching a small search term. If it was completely uh, un, uh, unstructured or if it was completely uh, without any regularity, then any one of those 2 power 16 functions might be the right answer. Yes, Learning without uh, assumptions is actually not uh, a good idea uh, because of this combinatorial argument. Okay, uh, the last thing I said was uh, uh, in the in the in the last lecture, and I know that uh, we we are fifteen minutes into the recap, and usually the recaps of episodes last only like a few minutes. But I think this is an important point, so I, I do want to dwell on this. So. We do want to respect the search space, and uh, the, I ended up choosing the wrong search space before, so we couldn't find a small function. We couldn't find the right function. So how do we pick the hypothesis space? We could pick a hypothesis space by using some prior knowledge. For example, um, uh, it's conventionally um, um, accepted today that for computer vision problems, the hypothesis space of convolutional neural networks is a good set. It's a set of functions. Um, things are slightly changing because of something called a vision transformer, but uh, we don't need to get into any of that now. There are almost like these recipes for using certain hypothesis spaces for certain types of tasks, and you could call that uh, you could call all those recipes uh, prior knowledge. But it's possible that the hypothesis space is so small that we don't find the right answer, which means we need our hypothesis space to be flexible. It should contain a large collection of interesting or naturally plausible functions. And uh, after through the entire semester, we will explore many, many, many hypothesis spaces that are nice for classroom examples, but not really useful in the real world. And then we'll also explore hypothesis functions that are useful out there in the wild because they are flexible. They contain many interesting functions. Another hypothesis space that I suggested was uh, there's something called an M of N rule. M of N rules are awesome because I have never seen them outside of textbooks and classroom examples. Uh, it's one of these sort of nice toy examples that you can use for uh, confusing people or explaining a concept, but I don't know why it's there otherwise. Anyway. Um, so an M of N rule has the following shape. I have a bunch of variables here, x1, x2, x3, x4. You choose some N of them. You fix N of them. In this case, let's say I fix um, x1, x3, and x4, which means I'm saying x2 does not even enter into the thing. x2 is a feature that is not particularly, um, it, it basically confusing. It, it's not, that feature is irrelevant. So I pick these three, uh, features and in this case n equals three because I picked three of them and m in this case is another sub is a number that's less than n and I say if at least m of these n features are true the output is true so in this case so for example I could say if at least two out of x1 x3 and x4 are true then the output is uh, one otherwise the output is zero so the learning algorithm, whatever it is here, has to first find a subset of these variables and then pick a number m. Now, I'm going to leave this as an exercise for you. Maybe uh, some, someone has already done this, maybe it's not. The exercise was to see if there is an m of n rule that fits these seven examples. Did anyone uh, go through that? Yeah. No, is there an M of N rule? 
uh, that check if there is one uh, that fits this data. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, basically, I just put the answer on the slide. Um, turns out that this particular M of N rule uh, fits the data. Uh, you can verify that offline. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to count how many M of N rules are there. And the hint is it's much less than 2 power 16. All right. So what does it mean uh, to restrict the hypothesis space? It's entirely possible that uh, when we restrict the hypothesis space, we might end up picking a wrong subset like we did with the simple conjunction. What we want to do is to pick an expressive hypothesis space that contains interesting concepts. And um, it, concept is another name that I'll use for the target function. Sometimes I'll call it the oracle. And one way or another, every use of machine learning ends up choosing a hypothesis space. So you may have heard of some of these M of N functions. We just talked about that. Decision trees is going to be the topic of today's lecture after I finish the recap. Uh, linear functions are a very well studied class of uh, hypothesis functions. Um, multi layer perceptrons, neural networks of all shapes and sizes, like transformers and convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks. You may have heard of all of these things, you may have used them. Invariably, anytime you make a choice of a function family, you are essentially choosing a hypothesis space. Then we can you know, create algorithms that explore this hypothesis space to find uh, uh, the one that best fits the data or find the one that for today's purpose fits the data perfectly. Once we do that, uh, then there's like a hope or we hope there's a theorem or something that tells us that there's generalization that's possible. What does it mean to find a hypothesis space uh, or pick a hypothesis space? You can think of learning as the process of removing uncertainty over a hypothesis space. What does that mean? There are all possible functions that can exist that map the instance space to the label space. Before I, before I make any assumptions and before I see any data, I have no idea which of those functions is the right answer, is the right one, is the oracle. And then I make a choice. I decide to you know, find a, restrict myself to a hypothesis space. At which point, without looking at any data, I have rejected all the functions that lie outside it. So if you want pictures, imagine that this is a set of all possible functions that can exist out there. My hypothesis space is going to be some subset of them. Let's call this H. And without looking at any data, I have decided that a function that sits outside it couldn't possibly be the right answer. This is, first of all, an assumption. But there is still some uncertainty left. The shaded region consists of many functions. So the process of learning, as we will explore it in this class, it can be seen as removing the remaining uncertainty inside this shaded region and finding this one function that is the best according to some definition of that. Um, there's a, yes, there's a question. Uh, so, uh, is there a necessity that the one functions in the shaded region should be equal to the shaded? Not really. Um, for now, no. Um, there are different definitions of closer, so I don't want to necessarily. Uh, um, um, pick one over the other, but there is no such necessity uh, a priori. So now if you, if you think of this picture here, when I think of you know learning as re removing the remaining uncertainty, if the shaded region was really, really tiny, imagine that the shaded region was so small, it had exactly one function. It's like you just pick a function, call it a hypothesis space, and ask your learning algorithm to go find that function. Well, of course, it's going to find it. It's there. So if your hypothesis space was really small, then learning becomes easy because the search space is small. But if your hypothesis space is really small, you might the true function might not be inside. So that's the trade-off uh, uh, you, you have to make. Not only would the true function not be inside it, the true function might be really far off in the sense of it could make every decision wrong. Every prediction would be wrong, for example. 
So um, for, uh, from this point of view, you can think of learning as one of the first steps of the, any learning algorithm is deciding on what your hypothesis space is. Now, this notion of thinking about hypothesis spaces is so pervasive that people don't even talk about it in uh, most machine learning papers today. People don't say my hypothesis space is a transformer model with of this uh, shape. People just we just write, oh, we are going to design a new transformer model. We essentially, a lot of uh, these model design papers that some of you may have seen is a statement about a hypothesis space selection. It is so pervasive that people don't even talk about that. That that terminology is not used except when people want to make a point about some formal property of these things. Okay, so to wrap up the recap, in the last lecture, we looked at what an instance space is. These are just inputs to the problem. It could be documents, images, uh, badges, names, and such things. Uh, we looked at labels. This could be um, binary, it could be multi-class, it could be a real number, in which case we call it the problem regression. And we spent a fair amount of time discussing this notion of a hypothesis space. Importantly, in this discussion about hypothesis spaces, we never talked about any algorithms. We never talked about any notion of correct. We never talked about generalization or such things. It's just this sort of a setup. For the bulk of the rest of the semester, we'll be talking about individual learning algorithms or individual hypothesis spaces. We'll be talking about evaluation. We'll be talking about what does it mean for a certain classifier or a regressor to be successful? And all of this is going to occupy us for the rest of the semester. Um, yes. So, so how is feature selection is also some kind of learning that we have here? If I put into space, uh, uh, including the space, also a kind of machine learning algorithm. First of all, feature selection, I, I don't think I said feature selection is a learning problem. Uh, uh, yeah, so there is a line of work that has become somewhat popular in a last in the last few years called neural architecture search, which is essentially searching over hypothesis spaces using um, terminology using our um, technology that comes from neural network learning anyway. So there is work in that uh, in that, but in the limit, it's an intractable problem. Because it, it, the, the search space, now you're searching over all possible subsets of the concept space, which itself was big to uh, begin with. So it's a, it, it's going to be hard. It's, it's definitely a much harder learning problem. All right. Um, are there any questions on Zoom? No. Nope.